Welcome back. This is the second lecture on Plato's forms. In the first part, I, which was very much an introduction, I tried to give the idea of Plato's early theory of the forms, which was so often called the theory of imminent forms. In that view, as expressed in the Euthyphro, which is a dialogue of Plato's, in the Euthyphro, what you find is that the forms seem to correspond more to definitions. Now, that doesn't mean that in, there's anything subjective in this. Uh, definitions are perfectly objective things. One, if one is trying to define something, what is, one is trying to do is to understand the essence of the thing and to try to uh, give that e essence without any redundancy. And that is what Plato does in looking for the essence of the holy. He doesn't find it. But that's the idea behind it, that were he to find it, he would have found an essence of the holy, which would have been, in a loose sense, the form of the holy. And it would be present in each of the instances of the holy, obviously, because every instance of the holy would have to satisfy the definition. And once you grasp that simple idea, the forms become a lot less uh, mysterious. Many people who talk about the forms seem to think that there is something sort of um, as though they're being taken for a ride metaphysically. Well, that's only a partly justified um, reaction to the forms. I want to come now to what is much more solidly the doctrine of the forms, which occurs in Plato's middle period, in the Phaedo, in the Symposium, and also in the Republic, most notably. Now, you may think that given that the forms are very much associated with Plato, that Plato would have put a lot of effort into describing the theory, that this would have been something that Plato would have laid out for everyone to see. But that is not true. Plato does not really lay out the theory of the forms at all. What he does is he hints at them and he gives analogies for them but there is no careful, as we would think today, a sort of careful scholarly laying out of, how, of the logic of how this is to work. We're left to pick up that from the hints that he gives. And he gives these hints most forcibly in the Republic, but also in the Phaedo as well. Now, here goes. First of all, in order to set this out, I want to give you the example that most modern philosophers who would teach this topic would give of a form. Here goes. Take all the leaves on trees. Let's at least take the green leaves on trees. Now, those leaves have something in common. Greenness. They all have greenness in common. Well, the greenness that they have in common is present in each and every green leaf. So you could say, here is something that they all have. Now, if we treat that as not a matter of definition, although we could, but if we treat it as here is something which these leaves have in common. 
then it seems as though we're looking for a one thing which is in many things, many leaves. One thing which is in many things. And that one is greenness, also leafiness. That's also in the leaves, or leaveness, if you like. They all have these things in common, so they are a one among many, one distributed among many. So the idea roughly, as a modern philosopher might put it, is that the greenness is something instantiated in each and every green leaf. That's the rough idea. And that's an example that most philosophers in a university would give as their main account of what it is for something to be a form. Now, the thing to note about this, which is most odd and conspicuous, is that that is not the example that Plato gives of the forms when he is discussing the forms in his middle period, when he's laying out the theory in, to the extent that he does. It's not. The forms that Plato discusses are essentially three. He discusses justice. He has discussed holiness. He, that's also probably going to be included. Justice the beautiful and the good. Justice, the beautiful and the good. These are the main ones that get mentioned in this middle period where we are looking to these examples in the Republic, for example. Why does he choose these examples? Well, it's because in this middle period, forms have a particular quality to them, which is most surprising. Let me take the beautiful first as a sort of a, a, an example that Plato spends much time on in the symposium. And it may well have come from Socrates himself. This may well be a Socratic example. The beautiful. Now, the first thing you have to do when you understand this is you have to realise that for Plato, the beautiful or beautiful things are not subjectively beautiful. They are objectively beautiful. Namely, there would be a large amount of agreement on, for example, a person. If a person is beautiful, it would not be a subjective matter. One could not say, well, this is beautiful, but you're not getting it because, you know, it's too subjective and, and you're not seeing it as you should. That would not have passed muster. Plato thought that the beautiful was something objective in things, in people. We might say in women, but perhaps for Plato... It would have been more pertinent to say in men, in fact. So when we look at it in this way, there is, we find that there is a sort of an oddity to them. And here is how we might think of it. We might think, well, suppose we were, given that it's an objective thing, we might, uh, we might also think it's an objective matter, who or what is more beautiful than who or what else. So we might be able to rank them. We might be able to say, this is the most beautiful person in all of Athens. And in fact, we might be able to say, this is the most beautiful person or thing in all of Athens. That's Plato's idea that, oh, first of all, beauty is objective. 
you're going to have trouble with that probably, but that's his view. Beauty is objective. And that it's a rankable thing, that one can be more or less beautiful than something else. One can be least beautiful than other things. And that we have here a progression, a progression of more and more beautiful things, people, whatever. Now, these, in Athens, for example, there may well be a most beautiful, okay? And that, because it's objective, that would be mostly agreed upon. There will be some people who don't see it, but that's irrelevant because there are some people who don't see many things. But that's right. That's fine. It's There are people who are allowed to not to be able to so attain to this objective view. Fine. That's always possible. Just as there can be people who have no taste in food or who have no taste in scents or who have no taste in you know, beautiful flowers or whatever. There are always people who just don't get it. Right, well, we're looking at the people who do get it. And the idea is they will mostly agree on the succession and the order of these most beautiful people, things, whatever. Okay. Now, if you're with me thus far, you can see it, whether you agree to it or not. But if you can see it, then here's the next step. Given there may be a most beautiful, but... It's always possible to conceive, even beyond that, of a more beautiful still. Someone, something, painting, music, whatever, that is more beautiful than any of the things that we have had in front of us. You know, it's a memory of someone who did exist. Maybe it's a memory of a song, a tune, something that did exist. Maybe it's a memory of a painting or a sculpture, which is more likely for the Greeks. Maybe that would have been more beautiful. But maybe there was no such thing. But maybe we can just conceive of there being something that is more beautiful. So you can see that if there is this progression, the progression may, as it were, have a limit the most beautiful, where the most beautiful is not something which we have in front of us. We have to just say, well, it's possible that there is a most beautiful, and it partakes, it is shared into the things which are beautiful, but nothing partakes of all of that most beautiful. That most beautiful is the form of beauty. It's like a, a progression towards something which can never quite get there, but where that limit must exist. The limit must exist. Now, you can do this also with the good, good acts, good things in general. Plato is not precise in this about what the good would be, but we, we know that there are goods, there are things which are good. And so we think of these, we're in Plato's terms, we think of these as objective goods. And these objective goods can be ranked, again, with respect to one another. So the claim goes. I think it's tricky here, but that's the claim. So we can rank these, the good, in terms of a progression of goods. So there is a worst, hideous tyranny, hideous ty tyranny and torture, and then there is the best of the good, the, the, the best that we have. It's not perfect, but we can imagine more perfect examples of the good. We can imagine it, in other words, getting closer and closer to the good. It approximates to the good. It converges to the good. So, we imagine that the good, 
the good in itself, the good which is the purest good, the form of the good, is exemplified in each of the instances of the good. You see? Now, you could probably try to paraphrase all of this in terms of definitions, except for one thing. Plato thinks of the form of the beautiful and the form of the good as self-exemplifying. In other words, the form of the beautiful, that thing, the beautiful which everything that is beautiful converges towards, the form of the beautiful is beautiful itself. So it exemplifies the form of the beautiful itself. It's self-exemplifying. And similarly with the good. The good converges, all the things which are good, converge towards the form of the good, which is nowhere wholly exemplified because it's the perfect good. That good is itself good and because the just the beautiful and the good are self-exemplifying they must be things because it makes no sense to speak of a definition being beautiful or a definition being good definitions can't be self-exemplifying one might say but for plato it's important for the forms that they be, these forms at least, these forms that they be self-exemplifying. The form of justice is just. The form of the beautiful is beautiful. The form of the good is good. This self-exemplification is a crucial step for Plato. It is what makes the difference between his middle period forms and his early theory in the Euthyphro. This theory, by the way, the standard example that is normally given of a form that I gave you at the beginning of leaves and greenness, that makes no sense on this theory, on this middle theory. Because it makes no sense to say of the greenness of leaves, if the greenness is the form of green leaves, it makes no sense to say that greenness is green. The form of greenness, the form that is greenness, is itself green. The form of greenness, I think, would, one would say is colourless. But that's not the case for Plato's main examples of the forms in these in the middle Platonist period. The forms in the um, the forms in uh, the middle period, justice, beauty, the good, these are self-exemplifying. Since they're self-exemplifying, then the good, the form of the good is good. The form of the beautiful is beautiful. The form of the just is just. So in the symposium, which I urge everyone to read, it's a nice, simple read. It's beautiful, beautifully written, one of Plato's most beautifully written dialogues. Read it from cover to cover, end to end. You'll have something wonderful. In the symposium, the vision that Socrates outlines at the end of that symposium is he is told... By, I think it's Diotima, he's told by Diotima that who's a wise woman in Greece, he's given this vision of the beautiful and he's, he's required to see that if we progress through the beautiful things, those things are as nothing compared to the beautiful itself and it is a vision that she gives to him that the beautiful itself 
is beautiful beyond comparison to the beautiful things. The beautiful things are, are just the earthly manifestations of the beautiful, but the beautiful itself, that is beautiful beyond human comprehension. So that self-exemplification is part of a great vision that Plato has, that is part of the middle period Platonism. Plato wants to stress that the middle, that in this middle period, the forms are, to a large extent, they are, they are matters of exemplification. The forms are things which are exemplified partially in things in this world, the just, the beautiful, the good. But nothing in this world fully exemplifies them. In other words, the form always has <clears throat> some remainder of itself, which has, it has not given to the things in this world. But the form itself is self-exemplifying. So the form of the beautiful is beautiful. The form of the good, if you could see the good, you would see a good beyond anything that this world has to offer. Remember, this is 340, sorry, no, 380 BC, so we're a long way from the modern period. That, though, is the vision. With the just, with the holy, which we haven't had, but we can put that in there as well. The beautiful and the good. So now you understand. The good for, or the, the, the forms for Plato in this middle period are not merely definitional. They are things. Why do you, why you say, do they, are they things? Well, because not only are they the forms themselves, but they exemplify themselves. Therefore, they're both thing and property. They have their ownness, their own self as property. So they're, not just um, things, not just properties, they are both together. They are things that exemplify themselves. They are limits, if you want to use a mathematical expression, of the things which are beautiful in this world, the things which are just in this world, things which are holy in this world, the things which are good in this world, things which are beautiful in this world. They are limits of those things and they exemplify themselves, therefore they are not just forms in the sense of definitions. They are things in themselves. That's how you get the idea of transcendent forms in Plato. They are transcendent because they self-exemplify. And because they are not ever fully exempt, they are not fully instantiated or exemplified in the things in this world. Rather, the things in this world merely approximate to them. That's the idea of the forms. Now, Plato's, ex Plato's way of explaining this is in his famous cave analogy. And that's what I'll give you next. Okay. Let's try now to tackle the difficult question of Plato's cave. It's, it's described in many places and it's often not described completely accurately. And that is partly the fault of Plato himself, as we'll see. So here goes. The basic situation is that, put up an illustration that's from the Greek period. So, from the far right, we have the entrance to a cave. It's distant so that normal light doesn't get into the cave. If we go down this entrance into the cave and then the cave opens out. And there we have a 
fire at the back and then in front of that fire there is a walkway in which men walk carrying items. These are of many different kinds but Plato implies that they're all man-made items for a not very clear reason. But pots, for example, obviously pots are a good example, but other things as well, like uh, farming equipment or um, items of you know, books, for example, just a, a book going by, or a fishing rod going by. These things are not seen in themselves. They are all the people in the cave see are shadows on the far side of the cave. Now the prisoners themselves in the cave, the ones who see the far side of the cave, they are chained from birth into their seats. And they are chained in such a way that they can only face the shadows on the wall of the cave. So as the shadows go by, these men, because he doesn't actually describe them any as women, um, these men see these shadows passing by and they, they hear a murmur of the people who are actually carrying these things behind them. And they associate those murmurs with the items that are being carried. If you want a, an image of this, think of... Um, um, of Clockwork Orange, the film Clockwork Orange, where Malcolm McDowell is chained into, or was fixed into his seat, can't move, and has to face the stage, and has his eyes sort of glued open. Well, they don't have their eyes glued open, or fixed open, but nevertheless, they are fixed in their facial positions, so they can only look forward. They can't look to either side. They can talk to one another, and they do but they can't see one another properly unless it's out of peripheral vision. Now, this is the situation for these men from birth. And Plato says, this is us. This is what our life is like. Now, one man is unchained and released. And Plato is a literary artist. He goes into some descriptive detail about how it feels to be released from the chains. At first, he's reluctant to go anywhere. He doesn't know anywhere else. But then he turns around and even though the light is in his eyes, he sees that there is this wall behind him that he's never seen before. And there are these things being carried. And he never knew that. He only knew the shadows. And then, still aching from being shifted out of his position, still being very weak, he is then dragged up the slope of the cave until eventually... He is outside the cave for the first time in his life. And Plato, again, gives much descriptive detail. At first, he can't look at the plants and the trees and the flowers and the rest of the stuff and the other people, the people who are outside. He can't see them because he's blinded. But he can see them in reflections. And that's what he first looks at. These things seen in reflections. But gradually his eyes adjust and then he can look at these things themselves. And finally, he can see the sun. Just as in the cave when he looked back, he could see the fire. Now he sees the sun. And Plato says, and this gives the idea that it's clearly a metaphor because 
Plato knew well enough you can't look at the sun. But he says, he looks at the sun at, as the thing in itself. So, what is this world out of the cave? Well, inside the cave, the man only saw the shadows. And he took those shadows for the real world, for the world as it really was. He knew nothing else. Again, you have to give allowances here for this is this is a metaphor, an image. This can't. This is not literally supposed to be true, and Plato doesn't think that it can be taken completely literally. But he's because when he's seeing the wall of the cave with the shadows on it, he's of course seeing the wall of a cave, which is not a shadow. It's a real wall of a cave. But he wasn't seeing the pots and the, and the fishing rod and all the things that were being carried past that he only sees as shadows. He wasn't seeing those things. When he gets up, creaking from his seat, he sees the, the pots and the pans and the fishing rods and the farm equipment and all the rest of it going past. And then he knows, and he also sees the fire, which blinds him a little bit. Then he's outside. Now, what has he seen when he's outside? You may say, well, he's seeing, he's seeing real stuff now. He's seeing the real, real world, the world of pots and pans and, and trees and leaves and flowers and all the rest of it. And he's seeing the sun shining on those things. But no. That's not Plato's idea. Plato's idea is that when he goes out of the cave, the things that he sees, pots, pans, people, plants, flowers, trees, sky, clouds, these things are the forms In the cave, he saw a sample of those forms having their shadows cast on the wall of the cave. Outside of the cave, he sees not things, but forms, forms themselves. So that's why this is an easily misunderstood metaphor. When the man is out of the cave. He's not seeing the stuff of the real world. He hasn't gone into the real world. He's gone into the realm of forms now. And that's a, such an important point to get. He's in the realm of the forms. Well, what then is the sun? That is the million dollar question. What is the sun? The sun allows the man to see and understand the forms. The sun is itself a form, a self-exemplifying form. It is, wait for it, the good. The good. The sun is the good. The things that he sees outside the cave are the forms which are illuminated and unified by the good. The good has a role. It doesn't just, it's not just self-exemplifying. It is the thing which allows the forms to be coherent among themselves, to be forms. It allows the forms to be the forms. So these forms are then seen inside the cave, at least a sample of them, passing by making the shadows. The sun is the good and unifies the forms which the man sees outside of the cave. What does Plato say 
if the forms are in a realm of forms, they're not in, they're not, you know, just outside in, in uh, outside in the, in the sort of, you know, daylight, if they're in another realm, a realm of the forms, where is the sun in this metaphor? Plato's answer is very surprising. Only if you understand this do you get the whole image. Plato says, the form of the good, the sun, the form of the good is beyond being. Beyond being. The forms are unified and we understand them with the aid of the good. The good allows us to grasp the forms, just as the sun in the real world allows us to see the various things. So the sun in Plato's image, the sun is the thing which allows us to think with the forms because the forms are not perceptual, they are intelligible. That's what the word he uses, it, intelligible. The forms can be thought, or they're the objects of thought. I can think about the form of a trees or persons or vases or this or that. These are all things I can think of and with. They, my thought is a thought using these things. The form of the sun allows all of that to happen. It illuminates the mind so that the mind can grasp the forms. The forms are intelligible in virtue of the form of the good. Because the intelligible is the realm of genuine being, it's the real world. That's the other thing you have to understand and remember about Plato. Plato's idea is not that there are two worlds, it's that there is one real world and that's the world of forms and there is another world, the world we see about us, the world of objects in our daily life. That's not a real world. That's not the world. It's not a world that competes with the world of forms. That's a world of illusion, a world of opinion. That world is not genuine. It is a world of of images, of things that have been so were filtered through this realm of forms so that they are the things which we can perceive. But that, that whole thing, that realm that we see, is not the real world for Plato. The real world is the world that we can think about and understand, and that is the world of forms. It is the world of real, true being. But because the sun has this role of being the determiner of allowing us to see or think with this world of forms, because it does that, it can't be another part of being. And that's why Plato says it is beyond being. It is beyond being because it does the job of unifying the world of being, which is the world of the forms. Then the world of forms are instantiated in the world that we see, which is merely a world of opinion. It's a world of frequent error. It's a world which is subject to the limitations of our senses, our senses don't see things as they really are. They see things as they appear to us. That appearance, the way that they appear to us, is limited. And it is not something which we... It is not something which uh, we can fully use our intellect on. Our intellect 
is really restricted to the realm of the intelligibles, the forms. That is what our minds can operate on. Now, again, you have to go back and think also that Plato got into this idea with maths. So think of it this way. Think of, and this is something that people often do with the forms to, as an illustration. Think of circles as they appear drawn in the real world, where they can be very rough and ready. They can be not very good circles at all. But there is a, a perfect circle, which is nowhere exemplified in the were in the real world and of drawn circles and that would be the perfect circle which is a mathematical entity which can be appreciated by the intellect so it's the form of the circle is a form our mind is illuminated with geometrical um, propositions about the circle by the form by the good which which is beyond being. So that which is beyond being illuminates the realm of the, ge of the geometrical entities in themselves, the proper geometrical entities, the entities that Euclid described, the genuine right angle triangle of side one, one and square root two, the genuine circle of whatever radius you want, and all of the rest of the geometrical entities which Euclid gave an account of slightly slightly later than than Plato was alive, but yes, he did he, he summarized everything that was known up to this up to his point about the mathematical entities that Plato had been most interested in. So the intelligible entities are really correspond to things like the perfect circle, the perfect right angle triangle the perfect equilateral triangle, the perfect square, perfect cube, perfect the numbers, all of that, all of these things are things which exist in the realm of the intelligibles, but the things that exist in, on the walls of the cave are imperfect circles and imperfect, um, say, um, equilateral triangles or whatever imperfect cubes etc we only see the imperfect things but our minds can contemplate the perfect things now to complete this metaphor of approximation of how the mind can understand grasp the intelligibles and where the imperfect things are approximations to the in, to the fully intelligible things go back to what i was saying about square root 2 there are fractions which approximate over and under, over and under to square root two, but never get to it. They approximate to it, but never arrive at it. Square root two can be regarded then as a form. And the fractions which approximate to it are the things which are merely close to it in the realm of appearances. Just in the same way there was this approximating procedure to the beautiful, so the beautiful is the limit of that approximation. So there is the same thing in the world of the good. There are things which are good, more good, less good, etc., etc. Going towards things which are the best, but they're nowhere near the good. The good is something beyond that. So the approximating nature of this exemplification is perfectly illustrated in the thing which Plato speaks of constantly, over and over again, how we can have these square roots of numbers which are in, to some extent intelligible, well they are intelligible because we can do things with them, for example we can square square root 2 and we get 2, that's, that's something we can do with it. We can understand it, but the things which we can give in the real world are only fractional approximations to it. We can't give a fraction which equals square root 2. But there is a square root 2. It's among the forms. 
It's a very good example, in fact, of something among the forms which is not which is not exemplified in in itself, fully in itself, in the real world, but only to an approximation. That's the model. Now, in the, the cave example has something else, too, which I have already alluded to. I talked about um, orphism. Orphism is a is a belief in um, a practice involves certain very crucial gods, Dionysus, Apollo. It makes those gods into really crucially important gods in the process of how you live your life and how you might survive death. Orphism was all about surviving death. What kind of life do you need to survive death? What kind of life do you need to live in Orphism? You need to be purified. Orphism was a doctrine about purity. Now, part of that purity was a going into the underworld, as Orpheus did. He went into the underworld to sing to Hades, who is also Dionysus in the Orphic mythology, to sing to Hades to have his wife released. And she is released, and she, he's, she's released on the condition that he not look back. Unfortunately, a sound is made on the passage up from the underworld to the real world, and he loses her, and she goes back into the underworld, and that's his last chance. This is a part of this myth, this mythology that's attached to Orpheus. Orpheus purifies in the underworld, probably in mystic rites that happened underneath the ground, in caves or in basements or wherever, wherever they could find to do this. And these mystic rites purified the, the, the mystic celebrants. And it's likely that Plato was, at least to this extent, Orphic, that he believed in these rites. He cites them, he quotes them, and it may be that that's what's underlying this myth of the cave as well. Underneath, you can be released from whatever is chaining you, and you can go to the upper world, the world that is of the world of the intelligibles, and there you will see the real world. And when you are fully accustomed to that, you will even see the good, that non-being, the being that unifies, or the thing, whatever you want to say, this is possible to say, the thing that unifies all of the forms, will be something that you can see. You are purified. You are ready now for the next life. When you come to your judge, who is Hades um, or Persephone, Demeter, or Dionysus, when you come to your judge, depends on whether you're male or female, when you come to your judge, your judge will ask you certain questions, you must give definite answers to them. If you do, you can pass to the next stage of existence. The best passage to the next stage of existence is not to be reborn, but a passage which you gain to the stars. In a sense, you become a demigod in the stars. That is the ideal passage for you out of this world. That is what you have done the Orphic purification ritual for. And you can now see how well this fits with the whole image 
of Plato's cave. It's a purifying ritual based on the Orphic rituals, which long predate Plato's writing about the cave, in which Plato is describing how you can pass to this final vision of the good. How you will see the sun. You will look at the sun. Of course, you can't do that really, but that, that's the idea. You can look at the sun and you will see that the sun itself is good. It's self-exemplifying. But it is nevertheless beyond being. That's your path of transcendence in Plato's world. That's why all of this imagery exists in order to present this passage myth of how you can see the way things really are. And it comes partly from these ideas of the just, the beautiful and the good, which are possibly Socratic, mixed in with these other notions of approximation and self and approximation that you get from the mathematical ideas that came from the Pythagoreans. The Pythagoreans were also heavily involved in the Orphic mysteries. I think Heraclitus accuses Pythagoras of writing some fake Orphic hymns, which is very unlikely. The Orphic hymns were known to predate um, the 6th century. But, you know, Heraclitus was never one to miss an opportunity to slag off his contemporaries or other philosophers. He never missed that chance. Um, and so what we have is all of the things that which I've described before all piled together. Pythagoreanism, Orphic mysteries, the idea of putting these things together with Socratic ideas about justice and holiness, etc., putting it all together in such a way that the whole makes sense. That is the doctrine of Plato's middle period forms. I hope now it's a little bit clearer than it probably was before. Okay, thank you. Please like and subscribe. Oh, and also I should say this, here is, as I go out, here is a podcast of two bright, very bright, high school students talking about some things, including Plato's Cave. And you're welcome to have a listen to it and um, well, enjoy it for um, the sort of uh, youthful naivety, whatever you want to say, that it contains. It's kind of wonderful. Okay.